On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with author and blogger John Michael Greer about science, technology, and the long descent. Our idea of our history is always Mm -hmm. that how we've come through the dark ages, whatever they may be, however Mm -hmm. we define them, and Mm -hmm. now we're in a period of enlightenment. We've arrived. One of the ways that I've taken to talking about this this fantasy of ours that we know the truth about the universe and everyone else in history was just plain stupid is to think of it as 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 a ritual drama, a ritual play, like an Easter pageant or a a passion play, or you know, the, every culture has its ritual dramas where it, they sort of enact the mm-hmm. the sacred truths of their society. Our ritual drama, if you've seen any you know TV special or children's book about science and this kind of stuff, you've got certain stock characters. You've got the lone visionary who sees the universe the way it really is. You've got the conservative opposition who are kind going on in doleful tones, oh, you can't do that. And you have this particular conflict between them that just sort of of lumbers through. And history gets rewritten, seriously, massively falsified to fit that paradigm. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and on today's episode, John Michael Greer, very interesting writer and blogger who was referred to me by Skeptico listeners, and I'm so glad you did. Another one of these guests that's come from Suggestion that opened up new vistas for me. He is a druid, and we're certainly going to talk a little bit about that. And he has some rather provocative ideas about science, society, and progress. It's an interview I think you'll enjoy. Let's get right to it. Today we welcome John Michael Greer to Skeptico. John is a prolific author, having written well over 20 books, including The Long Descent, A User's Guide to the End of the Industrial Age, also The Druidry Handbook, Spiritual Practice Rooted in the Living Earth, John is a practicing druid, something that I'm anxious to talk to him about and learn more about that, and as well as many other titles, and we might touch on some of them in in the interview, but there really are too many to go over. There are some fascinating, fascinating titles, and there's some fiction and nonfiction in there, and we'll just kind of see where all that goes. John, it's a great pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much for joining me. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be on. So your work was brought to my attention by several skeptical listeners, and then most recently, Eric reached out to you and asked you to come on. I'm really glad he did. I wasn't that familiar with your work and started reading it, and I was like, wow, this is just brilliant stuff. I was like highlighting left and right, and I had a hard time getting through it because there was so much I just wanted to absorb. I'm going to jump right into this rather than ask a lot about your history and that kind of stuff, because I want to turn people on to some of the stuff that you've written and use that as a launching off point. So one of these blog posts that really caught my attention was The Clenched Fist of Reason, written in July of 2014. And this is on your your website. Is it The Well of Galibus? Well of Galibus. Galibiz, yeah. The Well of Galibiz. First of all, since you do delve into the Druidry, magic, occult philosophy, that's what the website is about. Maybe you can tell us, because I couldn't find it anywhere, what is the Well of Galibiz? Oh, okay. In the old Arthurian stories, when Merlin wasn't um, running around Camelot, bailing knights out of various troubles and doing all the usual stuff that that a working wizard does, at at least in legendary times like that, he could be found at his favorite hangout, which was at a place somewhere in Britain, uh, at a well or fount or spring called the Well of Galibis. So... I have two blogs. I have the uh, the Archdruid Report, which mostly deals with mm-hmm. politics and economics, the future of industrial society, minor issues like that. Right. But I wanted to do another blog that would get back to my home territory, if you will, and actually talk about the underlying philosophy and spirituality that I was bringing that. So the idea, just as Merlin went to, you know, back home to the Well of Galibus to hang out when he wasn't otherwise occupied, 
I have this blog where I can hang out and post monthly discussions of things that are inter of interest to me within the realm of spirituality and of Druid philosophy. Great. And, you know, that intersection is something I hope we return to again and again in this dialogue, because I think you are to be commended for trying to look at those intersections in that juxtaposition of industrial society, culture, the thing that we are immersed of and can't get out of, and spirituality, and in the larger sense of, of who we are. And, and I like very much that you take on that challenge. We try and do it on, that, on this show as well. It gets to the only kind of questions that really matter. If you stay isolated in one or the other, you, you wind up just looking rather ridiculous, really, uh, because <laughs> yeah. we have to merge these two together. So let me then jump back to a discussion of, I guess, where that intersection, I think, becomes most visible. And again, this is a quote from this blog post, The Clenched Fist of Reason. You write, I've long since lost track of the number of times I've watched distinguished scientists admit with one breath that the things we experience around us aren't real, and with the very next breath, act as though matter, energy, space, time, and physical objects are real in the most pig-headedly literal sort of objective sense. Expound on that a little bit. Okay, this is something that a lot of people who deal with esoteric philosophy, it, it's one of those things, you, you either tear your hair out or you shake your head. Because we all know, all of us who have who have a basic literacy in science, we all know that when we when we pick up a coffee cup, okay, what's actually there is not what we're seeing, not the you know the the color of the cup, the coffee in there, all this kind of stuff. It's a pattern of energy stresses in space time, literally unimaginable to us. We say atoms, but what are atoms? Again, atoms are energy patterns in space time. That's all that's there. Our senses receive the various promptings from those from, from those patterns in space time. Um, our senses, of course, our sense organs are more patterns in space time, more of these energy stresses, and that sets in in process this Rube Goldberg chain of transmissions, interactions, and processing that create in our minds the image of the coffee cup full of coffee. That image is a mental image. It's not a physical reality. The physical reality is the pattern of energy stresses, and that's all. Now, we get this, we know this, and yet an enormous number of people, including distinguished scientists, although not limited to them, immediately go on from that, having granted that, well, of course, that's true, but the coffee cup is a physical coffee cup. It's made of solid matter. It's, you know, white. It's full of coffee. As though none of that matters. And in fact, when you start paying attention to the implications of the fact that what is going on what we experience in our senses is an image constructed in our minds out of the promptings that we get by way of this Rube Goldberg chain of connections from energy stresses in space-time to images in our minds. Once you start grasping that and realizing that there are things that can be done, there's wiggle room there, that the ordinary sort of pig-headedly literal scientific sense doesn't allow for then life gets interesting. And that's one of the things that opens the door to magic. But of course, that's not, that's precisely what the scientific community doesn't want. They have a, you know, there's a long history there. You mentioned magic, you mentioned the M word, and then of course they're going to bristle. I was just going to say, there's, there's two ways to break that down. On one hand, there's wiggle room. And on the other hand, there is no wiggle room. That's mm -hmm. the problem with the paradigm that is in place. The materialistic paradigm doesn't mm -hmm. offer any wiggle room for consciousness being totally this product of this brain, of this material mm -hmm. thing that processes things in that Rube Goldberg mm -hmm. way that you're talking about. So mm -hmm. as soon as we even want to explore anything that might fall out of that, science needs to jam it back in or the whole enterprise kind of mm -hmm. comes tearing down and we go, gee, mm -hmm. how do we really measure things? So I kind of see exactly what you're saying. I think it, it kind of breaks down in a couple of ways. So mm -hmm. one, it breaks down in the in the sense, in the physics sense, like you mm -hmm. say, you know, what really is an atom and it's 99% nothing. You know, we've all heard that, right? So your coffee cup is really nothing and it's standing on a desk that is really nothing and how all that works, we're not really sure. And then there's this 
observer effect that we don't even know if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it. Is there really a tree? All those philosophical problems come really right to the front of the questions that physics is really asking. Mm -hmm. And I think that as soon as we step into the absurdity of what we're being given in terms of answers for that, we mm -hmm. we have to kind of reach over to the other side and look at anything approaching magic or anything approaching what might lie beyond that. Mm -hmm. And we have to say, gee, were we really so sure that we should have dismissed that all along? And to me, that's what really mm -hmm. kind of gets at this disconnect that you're talking about mm -hmm. between how they talk out of both sides of their mouth, because mm -hmm. they, they have to resolve these two things that, according to the game that they've set up, they're unresolvable. Mm -hmm. This typically happens in the late stage of every civilization. You get this pattern of ideas about what reality is supposed to be like. And that's a very important thing to establish, um, you know, a kind of map, a, you know, the, the map of reality that allows you to figure out what's where. Every civilization has one. But the problem is over time, people become so fixated on the map that they forgot to check to make sure that it fits the reality. And the number of, of anomalies, the number of things that don't work just kind of piles up. But people don't notice that because they're fixated on the map. The map has to be defended. It is true. Mm -hmm. When you start getting scientists going on about the laws of nature, okay, let's stop and analyze that phrase. Does nature have laws? Who passed them? How exactly. are they enforced? It's a metaphor. It's just a metaphor. Ultimately, it's a Christian metaphor with the serial number filed off. Laws of nature originally the idea of you know God as a kind of medieval king handing down laws for you know his, his created subjects to obey. But they've taken this metaphor, lost track of the fact that it's a metaphor, and are saying the laws of nature are what's real, and if your experience doesn't fit our conception of the laws of nature, your experience didn't happen. If the, effect isn't, if the cause isn't known, the effect didn't happen, <laughs> which is really bad logic. Yeah, and, and not only is it bad logic, but it's so out of touch with our day-to-day -day experience that I think it causes a lot of people to turn their back on science. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's amazing to me because I talk to so many scientists and they want to bemoan the fact that science education is is in such bad state and that public mm -hmm. awareness or interest in science. And I, I just want to say, well, you've just so failed at your core mission of answering the questions that we want to know about. Who are we really? How mm -hmm. do we fit in this world? And you've so flubbed it. And not only have you flubbed it, but then you've filled it in with such absolute bunk that anyone can look at like that, saying, you know, that my entire experience isn't really an experience. It's, mm -hmm. it's an illusion. And I'm a biological robot. And everything that has meaning in life isn't real. It's all just an illusion. People subtly, quietly, they feel a little bit of respect for the guy in the white coat, so they don't want to say it to his face. But they just turn around and privately say you know, we have to go on with our life because those people don't have answers to anything. And mm -hmm. then they wonder why they don't want to listen to scientists talk about global warming or talk about anything mm -hmm. else. Or, it, it, it's They've lost credibility because they've mm -hmm. fumbled the big stuff. They've also lost credibility because they're not paying attention to the, so, the social and economic dimensions of science, and a lot of other people are. How, I, I mean, I'm sure many of our listeners remember the days when all cholesterol was bad for you. When right. polyunsaturated fats were right. good for you, scientists and science changes. You know, science changes. The view of reality presented by science changes, and it should over time as new discoveries are made, old theories are discarded, and so on. The problem is that at any given point, your average scientist wants to be able to say this is true and have everybody outside the scientific community believe it on faith. And then six weeks later, it's well, no, this isn't true. That is true. And again, we're supposed to believe them on faith. It doesn't take that many times around that cycle before people start saying, you're talking out of your backside. Yeah, you don't right. actually know what's true. This is a tentative hypothesis, which you'll change in another six weeks. Now, when scientists say that to each other, that's okay. That's part of the community. That's part of the process. But when people outside the scientific community point that out to scientists, they lose it because there's that unacknowledged habit 
that acknowledge habit of mind by which scientists think of themselves as a priesthood. They think of themselves as the ones who know, and everybody should accept what they say, whatever it happens to be this week. You noted global warming. The I mean, there's plenty of reasons why global about climate change activism has fell flat on its face over the last decade. But I think the major one is that they tried to rely on the prestige of science at a time when science doesn't have much prestige left in this culture. And so people are going, okay, the guys in the lab coats are saying this six weeks from now, they'll be saying something different. But if you point that out to the scientific types, again, they lose it. They can't handle that people are watching them and rolling their eyes and going, um, yeah, that's this week's truth. Well, I think the other problem with global warming, and we've explored it on this show, is mm -hmm. that science is so married to political activism, not activism, that isn't the right word. It's, it's so married to the political power structure, and it's married to economic interest, mm -hmm. that we just have a hard time buying any of that. So when the whole thing came out with carbon trading, worldwide mm -hmm. carbon trading. And we saw, oh my God, these guys are trying to create a trillion dollar trading business that's just going to bankrupt us all in one way or another, at least get into our pockets in another way. I think a lot of people turned around and said, okay, I get it. In some way or another, this is some scam to get money. And then we saw, mm -hmm. you know, I had a friend who was directly involved in a startup in the Silicon Valley that was developing some I don't know, some kind of weird carbon trading software app thing. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty major thing. They had raised millions of dollars in venture capital money, and mm -hmm. they went to Reverend Al Gore for participation. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what they heard was, hey, if Al even steps in the room, he gets 25% of the deal going in, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the amount of money, and then so, as many people have noted, you look at the amount of money that – Gore uh, gained his net worth went well over a billion dollars from this thing that he had going, this idea, this platform that he had. I mean, it's hard to not have a cynical view of the mm -hmm. quote unquote science about climate change, whatever that science may be. I mean, I think we're all open to learning what the what the realities are and what we might be able to do, but mm -hmm. it's just hard to sort all that out, isn't it? It's it's hard to sort it out. It's and it's especially hard, you know, be, because as you say, there are these very evident economic and political interests that are playing football with it. Um, right. the, I mean, you talked about Al Gore on an, on a global level. You've got the way that the United States and and um, the EU were trying to use climate policy um, to shove. Uh, the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, right. into a one-down position at the Copenhagen right. talks. Right. And so it was just another way to try to play a trade war. And the BRIC nations are perfectly well aware of that fact. And they simply rolled the rides and said, yeah, try another one. Because the, And now the thing is, from everything that I can see, there is, there, I mean, there's reasonable evidence that treating the atmosphere as an aerial sewer to dump greenhouse gases is a bad idea, that it's causing climate disruption. Gee, exactly gee how that's what, a, to... what an astounding idea. Doesn't every, yeah, exactly. didn't we know that from yeah. uh, the last 40 years when we saw the ads of the smokestacks and all that? We all know that. So, we all know that. Right. The, quest, the question of how that's going to play out over the next few centuries is a complex one, but there's also this other world of financial, political, geopolitical game playing going on with global warming, with um, anthropogenic climate change, what Thomas Friedman in one of his few real square hits called global weirding as, as an excuse. So right. you've got to keep those two things separate and keep them both, keep an eye on both of them at the same time. Right. You know, maybe that leads back to, we take a much bigger picture. I love what you've written about myth. And mm -hmm. I think you're, again, in such a wonderful place to do it because you're coming at it both from a very practical sense of what's going on in our culture, society, but you're also looking at it from an occult philosophy standpoint, which brings a, a freshness to it. Here's some of the things that you've written. Our biggest myth is that we don't have myths. <laughs> myth, it, our myth is progress. Our history is cycles rise and fall of civilization. And let me do one more because I really love this one. 
our only version of history most people in the industrial world are willing to consider is one that explains how people have stopped believing in all the obviously muddle-headed things we used to believe and learn to see that reality is sitting right out in front of them all along. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to pull apart that last one. I love the idea <laughs> that our idea of our history is always mm -hmm. that how we've come through the dark ages, whatever they may be, however mm -hmm. we define them, and mm -hmm. now we're in a period of enlightenment. We've arrived, and I think mm -hmm. there's so many parallels with spirituality that we might want to talk about is too, because that's always the 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 real, I guess, gotcha in spirituality as well, is to have this illusion that we've somehow arrived someplace. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. let's not go there right away. Yeah. The thing of the, one of the ways that I've taken to talking about this, this fantasy of ours that we know the truth about the universe and everyone else in history was just plain stupid is to think of it as, as, as a ritual drama, a ritual play, like an Easter pageant or a, a passion play or, you know, the, every culture has its ritual dramas where it, they sort of enact the, mm -hmm. the sacred truths of their society. Our ritual drama, if you've seen any, you know, TV special or children's book about science and this kind of stuff, you've got certain stock characters. You've got the lone visionary who sees the universe the way it really is. You've got the conservative opposition who are kind of going on in doleful tones. Oh, you can't do that. And you have this particular conflict between them that just sort of, sort of lumbers through. And history gets rewritten, well, seriously, massively falsified to fit that paradigm. Um, mm -hmm. Classic example. Did you ever get taught that in 1492, when Columbus set sail, most people thought the world was flat? Right. Yeah, everybody gets taught that. It's a lie. Right. It takes 15 minutes of research in any decently stocked library to prove that it is a complete lie, a manufactured falsehood dating from the 19th century. In 1492, the standard high school astronomy textbook, and yes, they had high school astronomy textbooks in, 19, in 1492. It was called De Sfera. It was by John of Sacrobosco. It was in Latin. Of course, that was the Latin language everybody used for scholarship. And it starts with a set of proofs that the world is round. The world is a sphere. It is much smaller than the sun and much bigger than the moon. And the stars are so far away that you, you don't even bother to talk about it. And the proofs are accurate. Okay. This was this, everybody who, everybody who could read, who had more than a basic reading knowledge of Latin in 1492 knew the world was round. Columbus had an inaccurate measure of how big around the earth was. He thought that Asia was where the, was where, where the Americas are. He was wrong. And if there hadn't been two undiscovered continents in the way, he and all of his crew would have starved to death in the middle of the Pacific. Right. But so so, but but we have this idea. We've got to have the lone visionary who is right. We've got to have the doleful chorus of conservatives, and who who you know who will always say the same things. Okay, it's always oh you can't do that. Oh you're going to upset the the balance of the cosmos. Oh, and every single quote advance. Notice the metaphor there. Science advances toward what? In what direction? The direction of progress. What defines something as progress? Because it's close to us. The fantasy is that we are the pinnacle of the cosmos. We are the gate through which everyone has to go to get to the future. That's why people talk about, you know, this, these people being back in the Stone Age, these people back in the Middle Ages, people in, in, 21st, in the 21st century world. Okay? Everybody else is on, a, is on the march of progress, which leads inevitably to us. That's the fantasy. That's the mythology. Well, you know, it's interesting you bring up Columbus because it also points out the things that we edit out of that history as well. And I think mm -hmm. that's an important part of the, the myth of progress and the myth of constant improvement towards mm -hmm. the pinnacle of our existence. I mean, Columbus was a horrible horrible mass murder right and he, he wiped out well over a million people and he was he was conscious about doing it if you really read his letters our history and this is one thing i, I hadn't heard you really speak on or write on and I'd love to hear your thought is you know some people have pointed out some historians have really pointed out and i've taken notice that our history is so much tied to this mass murder butchery and gore 
at a really hand-to-hand level that we can't really get, mm-hmm. you know? So Genghis Khan or mm-hmm. Attila the Hunt or those people, you know, each guy had to lop off the head of 10 of the captives that, you know, we took over. The hand-to-hand combat of the Romans fighting, mm-hmm. killing people. And now we sit. Now we have people sitting in, a, in an air-conditioned room in Nevada, controlling drones by satellite, blowing up wedding parties and, and, ch- and children. Yeah. Well, there's it's two a, ways of looking at that. There, there's uh-huh. one way of looking at it and say, well, we're so far removed from it now. Or the other way of looking at it, is, we are the descendants of the Vikings. Oh yeah. So that post-traumatic stress disorder that has been handed down over mm-hmm. generation of generation is still right there and right beneath the surface. So when mm-hmm. we see the photos of Abu Ghraib and we want to go, oh, my God, that's not us. It's like, hell yes, that's uh, us. That's yes, always been us. Yeah. Social, so, social primates, most social primates are pretty violent. You know, chimpanzees defend their territories with violence and occasionally a stronger band will wipe out a weaker one. Human beings have been doing that for probably about as long as they're human beings. We are not naturally good, loving, peaceful, and kind or any of that kind of stuff. We have the capacity to be something other than than murderers. We do have that potential, but it's the potential that always ha- that has to be striven for. It doesn't happen automatically. I think in, in a lot of ways, one of the great flaws of the popular spirituality of our time is this notion that human beings are naturally good and kind and sweet and pure and peaceful. And if we just get um, something or other out of the way, we can all be good and pure and sweet and kind and peaceful. Never mind the fact that the economic order that supports our comfortable middle class lives depends on the suffering of millions of people in the third world. Exactly. So, how do we resolve that? What is the leap there from? that to magic from the industrial need of our society to consume, to dominate, to conquer, Mm -hmm. and then the jump over to magic. How how do we, and what is, what is magic in that sense? Well, I'll give you the, the, the definition that I learned back in the day when I was first doing my studies is that magic is there, the art and science of causing change in consciousness in accordance with will. Okay. Now, you'll notice that pe- people tend to go, oh, because that doesn't sound like, you know, Merlin and the cat covered with moons and stars. But you'll notice that, first of all, it doesn't say whose consciousness is being changed. One of the things that everybody has to learn in the course of magical training is that we all start out trying to manipulate the world around us. And ultimately you do that, you end up in this, with the kind of thing we've been talking about because the world doesn't manipulate well. It tends to manipulate back, it resists manipulation, you lose your temper, you start beating on it. Um, things go downhill from there. Back to the coffee cup that we talked about earlier. We are assembling our worlds out of the raw data of sensation according to patterns that we hold in our minds, typically unconsciously. Very often, the things that make our lives unsatisfactory have nothing to do with what's out there in the world and everything to do with how we assemble it. And so, the basic process, one of the basic processes, one of the core processes of magical training is a recognition that you start by changing yourself. You start by getting in under the hood of your own mental images, your own mental processes, your own expectations, your own emotional drives, and you say, okay, how am I frustrating myself? How am I making my life miserable? Because we all do. And we spend our time beating on the rest of the world because we haven't realized that, we're, we're, that we are the source of our own problems. You know, the one common feature in all, of, in all of your problems is you. And it's true of all of us. Okay? And so once you realize that, you can start disconnecting these various projections saying, you know, I'm, I'm offloading say, all of this, un- this, this unresolved anger from my childhood, not offloading it on these other people over there, producing this brittle, angry, tense relationship which blows up in violence. Okay, how about if I stop that? How about if I recognize that I'm carrying these emotions around and that I can do something else with them other than sort of project them blindly onto some other person whose skin color I don't like, let's say, or, or whose religion I don't like, or whose politics. I don't. People have all kinds of reasons for projection. Equally, 
you know, there's something that I think I want in, in life, whether it's money, whether it's, you know, hot sex, you know, much to be said for that, but, but you get the idea, you know, I, I want to have this lifestyle or, and you stop and you realize that what ha- what's happening is you're taking emotional needs from yourself and projecting it on these physical f- substances where they don't belong. You can have all the money in the world and you haven't met the emotional need because of the emotional need is inside you. It's not in the stacks of $1,000 bills. So with magical training, you learn to detach those projections. You learn to say, that's not what's actually going on here, is it? I've created this world of phantasms onto which I'm loading all of my unresolved emotional problems and then wondering why life sucks. Where instead you stop, you say, no, this is internal to me. I need to actually resolve this in myself. And then guess what? This huge problem that's been giving me, that's been making my life miserable for decades isn't there anymore because I know what's going on. How does this relate to druidry? I know very, very little about druids other mm-hmm. than kind of the cartoon <laughs> image that I get. White robe, golden sickle, mistletoe, Stonehenge. Oh, yeah. Well, I see pictures of you in the white robe there, so I, oh, yeah. I know there's, there's I some ceremonial. I have mistletoe. I've been at Stonehenge. So, yeah. The... <laughs> Basically, this is there's there's kind of a two part explanation. The ancient druids, no, the modern druids are not ancient druids. There, I'll get to that. The ancient druids were the priests and priestesses, the wizards, the intellectuals, the scholars of the ancient Celtic peoples in Ireland, Britain, and, and what's now France. And we don't know when they got started. Um, we don't know a great deal about them. All the surviving information amounts to about uh, 10 pages in English translation, and half of it contradicts the other half. We know they were there. We know they were kind of famous. We know they apparently had a very important part. And then the Roman Empire showed up, followed by Christianity. End of story. Okay, fast forward to the beginning, to, to the, the early part of the, of the 18th century. England. Early Industrial Revolution. You think the pollution is new? Not a chance. Smokestacks and coal fumes everywhere. Casual devastation of the natural natural environment. And you have two ideologies that are being presented for public consumption. There's the traditional ideology of dogmatic Christianity. And there's the newly founded idea of dogmatic scientific materialism. Take your pick. Both of them, by the way, cheerleading the Industrial Revolution. And so you had various people looking around for a third option who are saying, you know, that sucks, that sucks, no thank you, I want something else. One group of them found inspiration in what little was known of the ancient Druids. They studied that and they said, you know, that's kind of what we want to be. We want to find meaning and value to root our spiritual paths in nature, not in the pursuit of scientific of per, pursuit of power over the material universe through science and technology, not through bailing out of the world to um, you know another world on the far side of death, as promised by the dogmatic religion of that time. Don't worry about everything you're suffering in this life; it'll all be well when you're dead. You know, that kind of thing. And so they they took their a lot of their inspiration from what was known of the ancient druids and ended up adopting the name for themselves. So from the 18th century, there were lots of little groups like this, but the druids seem to have hit on something that worked in generation, year after year, generation after generation, century after century. We've been around developing this, developing our spirituality of nature. And that's gradually drawn on various things from various corners of, of the intellectual cosmos. One of the things it's drawn on mostly during the 20th century was that it picked up a lot of material from the revival of magic. And so you get a lot of people in the Druid scene who are very, who are, you know, to one extent or another, very familiar with certain schools of magical practice, who are teachers of magic design. And so, you know, there's this nature-centered spirituality, there's the magical dimension of existence, and those two have created quite an interesting fusion. And it's one that a lot of us find more compelling, more convincing, and frankly, more interesting than either the sort of um, dogmatic pie-in-the-sky-when-you-die variety of, of orthodox religion, or on the other hand, the dogmatic scientific materialism, <clears throat> you know, man, the conqueror of nature, and then you die. End of story. 
Yeah. I mean, there is a certain amount of strangeness about it in terms of how our culture relates to it. And mm -hmm. I almost feel like to a certain extent, you kind of embrace that. You kind of go, well, like, if you need to be shocked out of thinking beyond the couple of boxes you normally mm -hmm. see, then fine, I'll, I'll shock you a little bit, but then open your ears and, and listen. Let's let's probe into this magic mm -hmm. thing a little bit, because it's another word that, you know, really throws people <laughs> for a loop. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, magic and occult and this. And, and the one thing that, that, you know, I always come back to is like, hey, man, if you think magic is something foreign to what you've experienced in your Christian education or your Christian background. Forget it. I mean, magic is like so intertwined with the Bible. The Bible is a book about magic all over the place. Some of it is ordained in the doctrine of the church. Some of it isn't, but there's plenty of it there. I mean, That's what happens, yes. No, the, 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 there has been this tendency on the part of the, the sort of the sort of religious mainstream in the West to insist that magic has n there's no common ground between magic and Christianity does that, that and they're quite simply wrong. Most of just on a purely headcount basis, most of the serious magicians in the Western world um, for the last thousand years have been devout Christians. Many of the systems of magical practice that are out there are thoroughly Christian. They are based on the basic tenets of Christian belief. There are many, I mean, there, there are many schools out there where you have to be a baptized, believing, Trinitarian Christian to get in the door. But because it's, it's a complicated thing, why, why in, in our culture the mainstream religion should turn its back on so useful and so creative a dimension of life, while in most other cultures that's not the case. I mean, if you go to Japan, for example, Magical practice is is very heavily, very very heavily part of many of the of a certain a number of the important sects of Buddhism, mm -hmm. and and Shinto, the the traditional folk religion of Japan, is riddled with magic and divination, and nobody worries about it. It's just, so yeah. so let's break it down and make sure we're we're not talking in abstract terms. Mm -hmm. So we go back to the Bible. We talk about magic, and you can think about it in the kind of old-fashioned 60s TV show kind of thing. There are spells, there are laying of hands, there are mm -hmm. anointing with magical oils. There's all these kind of things. And in other traditions, Indian traditions, yeah. I don't know about the Japanese tradition that oh, you yeah. mentioned, but it's kind of the same. It's very much so. And, well, think of it this way. Who were the three guys who came to show, who, who, who showed up exactly. at Bethlehem when Christ was born? According to the Gospel, three Magi, three magicians who were what guided there by their study of astrology, yeah, and with gold frankincense and myrrh. Yeah, we always used to joke gold frankenstein and myrrh and wonder what <laughs> you know the Christ child would do with a large green monster. I'm sure he'd come up with something, but yeah, you know, the, so you have these three wizards, right, coming out of the east who had, who had, had figured out what was going on on the basis of their study of the heavens, astrology. Ooh. And who show up and, you know, uh, correctly identify what's going on and duck out fast so that Herod doesn't figure out where they've been. And, okay, so you there's know, something it, wrong with this? You know, there's also an interesting parallel that I've never really spoken with anyone about, but I, I'd be interested in your thoughts of it. Is mm -hmm. You know, there's a certain kind of shut up and calculate aspect to magic. And by that, I mean, you know, when you get into physics and you study quantum physics and they've reached this kind of point early on in the early 1900s when they say, what is this? This doesn't make any sense. And how can this be? And then there was this school of thought that said, look, shut up and calculate. Let's just mm -hmm. do the calculation, see how we can practically apply these mm -hmm. quantum effects and these quantum theories that seem to be playing out. And a lot came out of that. Mm -hmm. Global satellites, we have all sorts of technology that we couldn't, quote unquote, we couldn't live without if mm -hmm. we hadn't pursued that path. But they never really grappled with the really hard to understand philosophical mm -hmm. implications of I, what it I means. I see where that you're there's... going with this. Go on. So I, I just think that in the same way, the magical community has done kind of the same thing, saying, well, let's not worry about wh what is the true order of the universe or the higher spiritual order of this. Let's just try this. This seems to work. This seems to be efficacious over this period of time. Shut mm -hmm. up and calculate. Shut up and do the spell, <laughs> you know? 
Yeah, well, you you get that. You you unquestionably get that, especially the sort of popular magic that that pervades every society, including ours, is very much you know shut up and cast the spell type stuff. Fortunately, there's always been a certain there's always been some interest in in the magical community in the in the dimensions of magical theory in what what does this imply about the universe? You, you actually surprised me. What I thought you were saying is that. Mainstream religion is actually practicing magic, but they're doing it on a shut up and calculate basis. Totally. Don't ask why these things work. Just shut up and do the ceremony. Yeah, and they're even worse. They're even worse in that they're just going to not even be open to mm -hmm. all but just a small sliver of it. And it gets yeah. distilled down more and more. You know? And the thing is, there's a point to that. There's a point to the shut up and calculate. Again, you, 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 you can accomplish certain practical things, but it becomes a problem when it's taken too far when you, and when you start slapping really rigid limits on what people are allowed to think, what questions people are allowed to ask. It's one of the, one of the besetting problems of spiritual hierarchies is they tend to slap such questions down hard. Fortunately, at this point in the Druid community and the broader magical community, uh, we don't have much in the way of effective hierarchy, and so people can ask the questions they want. Here's another quote from you. Rationalism suffers from the innate and lethal tendency to lose track of the difference between the abstractions that it contemplates and the universe those abstractions are meant to represent. I think there's some of that going on, too. Oh, you yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you want um, to expound on that? Yeah, and we, we can see that in magic, we see, we, especially in religion. I mean, the, the entire argument of atheism are based on a simple logical fallacy. S statements X, Y, and Z about gods are absurd, therefore gods are absurd. Okay? Right. And that's, right. That, it's, it's a simple fallacy of composition. Anybody, in, anybody with a basic logical training should be able to see through them. In fact, they can't, does not speak well for them. But of course, we get the same thing in, in, in a religious setting. You get people say, well, the important thing are the dogmas. What are the dogmas? The dogmas are the mental models, the statements we have, the abstractions into which we, we fit the raw data of religious experience. And if religious experience doesn't follow those abstractions, oh, you know, the outcome, outcome the tortures are worse. It's, it's, a, it's a common tendency. We want to have a nice, neat model. But one of the things we know, one of the things we know absolutely about the whole spiritual realm is that it is not equal to our models. It is not nice and neat. It does what it wants to. And if our models don't fit that, too bad for the models. But but then what does that say about our attempts to try and change these models that we live within in this material world? I mean, I think a lot of your work is about mm -hmm. the, the the decline of the industrial society that, mm -hmm. that we've come to accept and kind of put up on this pedestal. And you make some great points, but doesn't a, a spiritual perspective kind of demand that we not play that game rather than that we become so sure that that game is headed in this direction or that direction. Don't we know from our spiritual insight that it's not about trying to fix that game. It's about trying to rise above it on a personal level. Mm -hmm. But th there's, there, there's two games going on here. There's two games going on here. There's a spiritual game. But we're not just spiritual beings. We're not disembodied bubbles of consciousness. We are also embodied material animal beings who have to get enough to eat or we suffer, who have various needs, who are trying to make things work one way or another, however stupidly, on the material plane. I, some, of the, some of the Renaissance magical writers used to put this in a very charming way. They talked about human beings as being amphibians. You know, you think of your, your amphibian animals like newts and, and frogs and so on. They live in the water. They live on land. Okay. Human beings, we're, we're amphibians. We live in matter. We live in spirit. We live in both at the same time. And we can't just do one without losing stuff that's essential to, be, to, to being human, without losing a part of the core of who we are. And so on the one hand, yeah. Each of us needs on an individual level to take such steps as we may in any given life.
to rise to, to rise a notch above our models, to look at them from above, to get that spiritual perspective on things, and to move closer toward to move further into a broader and higher, more complete perspective. But we also have to put food on the table. We also have to put, and not just put food on our own tables. We also have to guide, to do what we can to guide our communities, our families, our societies into more productive ways of living in the world. And so you've got those, you've got those two patterns going on at the same time. On the one hand, the movement in the spiritual direction. On the other hand, we have gotten ourselves in physical terms in a world of hurt, and that's not going to go away just because we all get a little wiser. We've done things to the world that are going to last for a very long time, and we have to live with the consequences of that. And we're also, we've also got a situation where most of the people in the world are busy pursuing a model of existence, a model of you know, happiness on earth, which is going to lead to unparalleled destruction. And that's also something that has to, it, it, that's common. I mean, no civilization ever has to be dragged to its destruction. We all take it at a run, yelling in triumph, convinced that the road to destruction is actually going to lead us to utopia on Earth. That's always what happens. And we're in the middle of it right now. You know, may, maybe, maybe we're in the middle of it. Maybe we're at the end of it. Maybe we're at the beginning of it. But I think most of us feel that when we get into these kind of apocalyptic visions mm -hmm. of either economic collapse or environmental collapse, that there's there's just a disconnect with me, how I live my life, mm -hmm. my carbon footprint. I mean, who can really relate to that in any real sense when there's this there's such a, a mismatch, a disconnect. Half the world's population is living on two dollars a day. Mm -hmm. I live in such obscene abundance compared mm -hmm. to that, that, mm -hmm. that I can never make those two balance. And I can go move. I, I support the idea that at least you back up your talk. I mean, you live mm -hmm. this low footprint life on the edge of the Appalachian Mountains. I don't. I don't even try and pretend. I don't even recycle because it's stupid to recycle. We we Where I live, the tiny little community where I live, they drive around these monstrous trucks among these houses that are spread apart to collect, you know, three or four plastic bottles from this person or about that person. It makes absolutely no economic sense, no environmental sense. And yet, I'm supposed to feel good about recycling. And I take that, that small example and I extrapolate up to the larger and I say it's the same thing. It's like these environmentalists want to run around and talk about carbon footprint. And then as soon as you bring up China or India, they're like, well, we don't really want to talk about China or India. Let me tell you about Sweden and about how they've reduced their carbon. Mm -hmm. It's like, come on, let's get real. Let's somehow try and connect that. Mm -hmm impulse to do well with policy, with actual political action that, that could mm -hmm. make a difference. And the connection just isn't there for a lot of a lot of reasons that wind up being start looking like old fashioned politics and power and war and struggle and stuff that we are so far away from having any influence of that it, it I don't think it really matters. Okay. Let, let's take that apart. Because there are several things going on here. I'm going to go back to Al Gore as an example. Because Al Gore, you know, we've talked about how he profits off the whole climate thing. He has also done a huge amount to destroy climate change activism. Why? Because of his frequent flyer miles and his huge air-conditioned mansion. You cannot get change, make, you cannot encourage other people to change unless you're willing to walk your talk. If you want other people to change, you need to model the change for them. You need to show them that it's possible to live a much less extravagant lifestyle and still be comfortable and still be happy. Until people are willing to do that, you're not going to have any change at all. When we talk about making sweeping changes on the political scale, okay, that's, you know, that's an issue. But the first thing that has to happen is that somebody needs to be willing to make those changes in their own life because you know as well as I do that if everyone's going around saying, I want everyone else to cut the carbon footprint while I, you know, climb on the jet plane to my speaking gig, people are sensitive to hypocrisy. They know what that amounts to. And so on a strategic level, on a level of strategy of influencing people, somebody's got to model it. 
Somebody's got to show that it's possible. Somebody's got to show that a lifestyle can be low in carbon and high in joy. And in fact, that that's something that is happening now as people begin to see, as it begins to sink in that the sort of middle class activist notion that we can sit in our comfortable suburban homes and be activists and um, profit from the suffering of millions of other people, that that doesn't cut it. That we actually have to change our own lives if we're going to change anything else. So we have that on the one hand. Okay, recycling. You've chosen a specific example, and it's an example, but in many places, you're right, it doesn't make sense. Where I live, I actually, I live in a city of 20,000 people. Okay, it's an old red brick mill town. The houses are, you know, they're not cheap by jowl, but they're fairly close. And so it actually does make a lot of sense to recycle here. We do have, we now just recently have a recycling program. And, you know, the, the, the garbage trucks are coming around anyway to pick up the trash. And so, you know, people have their recycle bins out. It saves the city a chunk of money because they don't have to, do, to pay for the disposal of the various recycled products. It's a win-win situation for everybody. If you live in a tiny town with, you know, vast, or, or this, one of these ghastly suburbs that Dmitry Orloff describes as looking like, like a cemetery, you know, you have the neatly mowed lawns with the houses rising like tombstones and nobody should, you know, should, should disturb those who sleep there. And probably recycling is not going to be economic, an economically viable approach, but there are other things you can do, like not live in a place like that. Actually, that's increasingly, that's common. A lot of the big outer suburbs are, are dying on the vine. They never made any sense of anything but real estate speculation anyway. Well, but so you've got a range of things that you can do. Recycling is not the only thing you can do. And remember, if there are all these people out there living on less than $2 a day, uh, you know, and you decrease your your carbon footprint, you decrease your expenditures, your extravagance, by a fairly modest amount, you're opening up a lot of space for this for a lot of poor people. So I, you I actually guess, have as a as a rich as a member of the global one percent. As a member as as you know a, I'm not quite in I'm not quite in the one percent, but no, uh, do you make um, globally if you make more than about thirty eight thousand a year, you're in the one percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. There right. you go. Globally, you're in the one percent. And so you have a much bigger impact on the planet than anybody else. Make use of that. Do something constructive with it. That's how I'd like to rephrase that. But I want to go on before before we bounce to to another topic just very briefly, because what lies behind all of the reasons not to do anything in most cases is fear. Fear of change, fear of letting go of these various, you know, middle class trophies, because then we realize how empty they actually are. We fill our lives with crap because our lives actually suck. We've bought into this idea, this is what you should have. You should have that big sprawling house. You should have the big loud car, the plasma screen TV, blah de blah de blah de blah And we sit there feeling empty and discontented and bored because none of it actually means anything. None of it is actually right on. worthwhile. Right and on. so we need to stop and say, okay, how about if I get rid of some of these things and do something else with my life? But well, but, but see, that, that's that. the leap. That, that's the leap. So I'm mm -hmm. with you right up to that point. And I uh -huh. think that speaks to the deeply spiritual aspect of this that that, mm -hmm. that can be the gift, right? Mm -hmm. So all this excess and this industrial nonsense, this this sociological kind of schizophrenic you know, don't worry about the war in Afghanistan, just go out and shop kind of stuff. And people are like Okay, what, but what's really going on here? But when you get past that and you, it, it generates that impulse to do something like you're mm -hmm. talking about, mm -hmm. there's another place you can get to. And that is, okay, what should I do with that impulse? Should I reach out to the person I'm walking across the street from who I don't normally smile to and I do smile at? Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I think we should do. I think the activism needs to be at that scale. And we don't need to kind of delude ourselves into thinking that we're going to change this machine. Let me just interject this little mm -hmm. story because I'd love to get your thought on this. You know, back in November 2010, I live right on the coast of California. I look right out at the Pacific Ocean. It's a fabulous view. 25, I think it was like 50 miles outside. This is national news, international news. There was this cork-shaped contrail that seemed to be rising from the ocean that everyone who's anyone in defense said, hey, that's a missile, mm -hmm. <laughs> probably fired from a submarine. 
Mm -hmm. On that very same day, a nearby Carnival cruise ship, a new one, with all these built-in redundancies, superpower thing, completely loses power, is dead in the water, unheard of, unfathomable that this could happen. Except that if you really listen to the people who know what they, success, what they suspect happened is that the Chinese were sampling, testing out, saber-rattling an EMP weapon to show the United States what we can do. And those suspicions have followed up in just this last year when the Chinese were very uh, open and upfront with the fact that they had used an EMP weapon to, to uh, disable a Japanese spy satellite. So mm -hmm. there is like the tiniest fraction of the American public who are aware of any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But if they were, you'd have to conclude that the game is so much bigger, so much deeper, so much more complicated than we can ever imagine, than, mm -hmm. to, than to think that, you know, any of this stuff that we're talking about could really make a difference with these people who are pulling the puppet strings and controlling our culture. Forget about it. Be nice to your neighbors. Uh, create a nice potluck this Sunday. Get together. Help people out. Be good. Live a good life. And don't worry about it. You know, it's the Christian, the the, the Christian give unto Caesar what is Caesar's was probably a, a, a meme that was introduced by the Romans to control the masses. But there's a deeper spiritual truth to it, I think, which is, you know, don't worry about that stuff. <laughs> I prefer the old piece of advice that was given to mariners back in the days of sail. When you went up in the rigging, one hand for yourself, one hand for the ship. Okay, You had one hand that you could cling like grim death to the rigging so you didn't get tossed overboard and drown. You had one hand that was hauling on a rope or doing what else you were supposed to do. I think each of us can face both ways. We can look at what's going on in our own lives. We can look at, we can change our own lives. We can change what we do. We can change how we relate to our communities, things like that. But it is important not to get too caught up in this myth of elite omnipotence, because I would suggest that that's also something that people in the political classes are very concerned to distribute the idea that they are the, uh, the omnipotent controllers of the planet, because if everyone believes that nobody's going to hassle them. In fact, what we've got are a bunch of largely clueless people who grew up very rich, who have no contact with the real world. I mean, have you ever spent time with people who are, who, who, who are really, really, really well off and were raised that way? I've had the, I've had the opportunity to do that on, on some occasions, and they are the most dysfunctional people you've ever met. They literally don't know how to wipe their own bottoms without help. And these are the people who are guiding our destinies. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the constantly fumbled American foreign policy the last 20 years. And that's partly because we are in, we're in a situation where there is no easy, there is no functional solution at all. When an empire is going down, it's going down. And no matter what you do, it just goes down in a different way. One of the lessons of history. But we've been really dumb about it. We have made mistakes that, for example, the British Empire was very careful to avoid back in its day. And the thing is, the people who run America are not that bright. They like to portray themselves as the masters of the planet, but they're just very rich and temporarily in control of a big, sprawling institutional system that has control of a lot of money and power and, and guys with guns. That's all. Now, does that mean we should all get out there and overthrow them? No. I mean, A, that's not going to happen. B, that's something they, that, they, that would be very much playing into some of the patterns they've been that they've been worried about, they've been trying to build toward for some time now. Um, there are other ways to deal with that. There are other ways to deal with a dysfunctional ruling class and a failing empire in a civilization on its way down. And I what spend are your a lot favorite, of time talking about what are, that. What are some of your favorite ways, and what where might people go to find out more about what you think about that particular little piece of this puzzle? The books that I publish from New Society Publications, which are all on the future of industrial society, most of those touch on these issues in one way or another. My recent book, Decline and Fall, The End of Empire and the Future of Democracy in 21st Century America, is all about this. So that would be, that, be the place that I'd recommend people go. As for what to do, 
it's it's one of those things where you choose a piece choose one end of the puzzle and start putting start putting pieces together one of the concepts i want to i want to hand our listeners right now is the concept of what what uh, postmodern theorist Ewa Ziarek called dissensus. We've all heard about consensus, right? Everyone sits down, comes up with a common idea, we all go and do it. Dissensus is the opposite. It's everybody figure out what part of the puzzle they want to work on, and we all go our separate ways and work on it. We need dissensus right now. There is no one right way. There is no one solution. The solution is for everybody to say, okay, this is what I'm going to work on. I'm going to work on, lo- you know, per- person A is going to work on local food security. He's going to work on developing the farmer's markets, the local gardens, the community-supported agriculture that will enable people to feed themselves as industrial corporate agriculture begins to grind to halt under, under the burden of its own economic failures. Uh, person B is going to work on revitalizing local democracy. Person C is going to work on something else. There's a million different things to do. If we're going to rebuild some kind of humanly viable society in the wake of the collapse of the industrial age. But, but John, does the impetus for those actions have to be the post-industrial age, the collapse of everything no, that we know? No, there's a lot of reasons to do it. It so happens that, we, that one of the major reasons we need to do these things is that the, the cozy system that we're used to is falling apart. But there's a lot of other good reasons to do it. You know, you can get into local food security simply because you loathe the taste of the uh, the sort of plastic pseudo vegetables you get at the grocery store, and dimly remember that you know locally grown, locally harvested fresh produce is is much better for you and much better tasting. And at the you same can, time, you can connect with yeah. all the other people around yeah. the world who are in the same situation. It's exactly. a wonderful way to, to to experience that connection that is real on a spiritual level. And, so, that's, uh, and that's another benefit. And it's another reason to do things. Again, dissensus is a good model because it allows for many different motivations, many different directions in a problem where there is no one solution. Well, John, John, your work is wonderful. I can't believe an hour has flown by so quickly. I'm, I'm sure we could talk more and more. Tell us, though, what's coming up for you. You've kind of talked a little bit about you are a very prolific writer. People can check out your two blogs. There's just tons of great stuff. I don't know how you crank it out like that, but you do. All, so many of the posts are worthwhile. Tell us where people can go to stay up to date on what's going on with okay. you. Okay. The two blo- my two blogs are the Arch Druid Report, http colon slash slash the Arch Druid Report dot blogspot dot com. The other one is the Well of Galabase. That's the magical one. And that's uh, http colon slash slash galabase dot blogspot dot com. In terms of stuff that will be out shortly, the big news is my novel of the decline and fall of the United States. Twilight's Last Gleaming. It will be out um, at the end of at the end of October. It should be. It would be interesting to see how people react to it. But yeah, great. Well, I'm I'm sure a lot of your fans will be anxious to see what that's all about. Well, it's been great talking to you and getting to know you. I really appreciate it, and I'll definitely be following your work. Maybe have you back on sometime in the future. Thanks Thank you. I, I look forward to that. Thanks again to John Michael Greer for joining me today on Skeptico. I'd tee up just one question from this interview, and it has to do with the opening clip, which I found really a fascinating topic, and that is on myth, and in particular on John's claim that progress is our greatest myth. So are we so conditioned to this myth of progress, this myth of technology and innovation that seems to be everywhere? Are we so drawn to that that we can't see some of the ways that we are not progressing? And maybe that our culture and our society is in some ways more fragile and on more shaky ground than before. That's certainly the claim of our guest, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Of course, the place to do it is through the Skeptico website at www.skeptico.com. That's S-K-E-P-T-I-K-O.com, where you can comment on the show right there or click on over to the forum or drop me an email or post me something on Facebook. So while you're there, of course, you can download any of our over 250 previous shows. They're all there for free, MP3 download. You can subscribe on iTunes, 
or you can join our RSS feed and hear about what's going on through that as well. Well, that's going to do it for today. I have a number of interesting shows coming up. And with this first interview, I have a new co-producer working with me. John McGuire is right now listening to this audio and chopping it down and making me sound halfway intelligent. And I certainly thank him for that. So with John's help, I think we're going to be able to get out more shows. That's certainly my plan. So we're going to push forward with that and see how it goes. But for now, I'll just end with the usual. Take care and bye for now.